Why, there must be dust in that ventilation. Welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today show and today our topic matter is natural sunscreens and kind of heaven forbid that I say that because the FDA refuses to allow any natural sunscreen or the listing of any natural sunscreen or sunblock ingredients on any products in the United States. So you can call it natural and then you can take a look at the bottle and find that it's full of petrochemical. There's very few what we would call as natural chemical free sunscreens. They look like a chemistry lab. Um, pretty much the only ones that we have available nowadays are just mineral blocks. But I want to go through uh, dietary and then topical oils that have known proven aspects that can be natural sunblocks and sunscreens that can either enhance the body's ability to fight off the uh, skin cancer or can enhance the body's ability to block it. So all conventional sunscreens have cancer-causing chemicals. All of them do. Just it's a given. So the moment you slap that on your skin or your baby's skin, you can assume that it can contribute towards skin cancer. Bottom line, there were some great studies that came out about 10 years ago on this issue uh, by certain uh, dermatologist um, uh, journals, and no press available on that one has ever been uh, pushed. So very disconcerting. So that's why I thought it was really important that I do a show on this. Now, when you utilize sunscreens, considering that 70% of Caucasian Americans and 97% of black Americans are vitamin D deficient and you slap it on the sunscreen, that blocks the body's ability to manufacture vitamin D. So remember, all these chemical-based sunblocks and sunscreens, vitamin D is so important for prevention of skin cancer and other cancers that this is another issue we have to look at. When we look at and everybody tries to say UV exposure is the cause of skin cancer. That's only a part of the picture and not a complete one because if your antioxidants are high enough and the right types of foods are utilized, UV exposure, UVA or UVB, you're not going to get burned and nor do you increase your risk of skin cancer from sun exposure. There are certain foods that have extremely protective of the uh, skin for prevention of developing skin cancer that I want to go over with you. And I would try to include them in your diet. Some of them are foods and some of them are supplementation that you can utilize. First one, cacao. Now, I'm not talking about your sugar-ridden chocolate bar that you get at the grocery store. Cacao, which is found rich in dark chocolate, is extremely antioxidant and very protective of the skin against sunburn as well as skin cancer. And you can get these cacao powders so you can blend in smoothies or even actually put a little bit in your coffee. Um, but you can get really dark 85% chocolates that will have that as well too. And a couple of nice pieces a day would be very beneficial for the skin. Green and black teas, even more so green tea because they have uh, polyphenols. And these are free radical scavengers, which can actually reduce aging in the skin uh, due to sunspots and UV, uh, UVA and UVB exposure by 80%. They work from the inside out. Um, according to several studies, drinking two or more cups of, of black or green tea reduces the risk of developing squamous cell skin cancer by 30%. That's severe, I mean a major reduction when you consider all the other things I'm going to talk about. Microalgae, algae such as spirulina, chlorella, contain a carotenoid called axisanthin. 
And this axisanthin is perhaps one of the most powerful antioxidants studied. It's 550 times more powerful than vitamin E. You can buy it in supplement forms and when my customers come in, I'll oftentimes recommend a 12 milligram dosage. But it has definitely been able to show uh, protection from UVA, UVB of both the skin and the eyes as well too. Or you can just start dumping in your chlorella and spirulina in your smoothies or taking it in pill form as well too. Now carotenoids, particularly for UVB exposure, and that's going to be your carrots, your yellows, um, usually your yellows and oranges, and your green leafy vegetables are really rich in carotenoids, which are known to give you, and you know, some people who eat excessive amounts of carrots will get that kind of orangey tinge to their skin. Well, that's very protective of the skin against UVB damage. Pomegranates. Now, pomegranates contain po powerful polyphenols, which strengthen the skin's upper layers. Now, when they do that, when you strengthen the upper layers, it uh, increases the resistance to the harmful UV rays. So if you like pomegranate or pomegranate juice, you know, it's been shown also for other types of cancers. Very helpful as cancer prevention and strengthening the upper layers of the skin tissues. Tocotrienols. Now, these are kind of heavy, um, and they usually come from uh, derivatives of rice, rice bran, and you can find some of them in palm oils, uh, as well as in rye and barley in low dosages. But they're 30 to 60 times more uh, powerful than tocopherols, natural tocopherols, and they reduce the, um, the skin's absorbing ability and the penetration of the UV rays into the skin tissue itself. So it literally blocks it. Vitamin C. You know, I think this is the most underrated supplement of all. And this needs to be a buffered C, uh, mineral ascorbate Cs, because that's how vitamin C is always found in nature. It prevents premature aging and is a very strong antioxidant that helps the skin deal with UVA and UVB uh, uh, rays. Very protective for prevention of skin cancer. You know, and C does something else. It strengthens not only the capillaries, but it strengthens the actual cells themselves. And how cancer gets into cells is it produces enzymes that mm, make these little collagen matrices weak. So when your C is deficient, the cancer can't readily enter into the healthy cells. Very important, uh, strong free radical scra scavenger for both skin cancer and internal cancers as well. Vitamin D. Now, it's funny that here we are putting all this sunblock and sunscreens on, and vitamin D itself <laughs> that the skin manufactures when the UVA, UVB hits you is actually preventative against skin cancer. So the things we're trying to block <laughs> with the sunscreens and all that are actually preventing us from getting sun, uh, skin cancer. So, you know, if you are extremely light-complected, particularly, um, you know, you have to be very mindful, you know, about that you're going to burn quicker. But from the discussion that we've had about some of these other antioxidants and foods can really give you some protection in that regard. So you can supplement with vitamin D as well if you're a little bit more sun sensitive. And most of the research is supporting between two and 5,000. You want a level, uh, I use, you want a level of about 50 on vitamin D when you take your blood work to maintain its anti-cancer benefits. Broccoli, probably one of the strongest antioxidant vegetables that we can eat. It's very rich in, in certain types of sulfur compounds that help the body, the, the cells of the body, um, to get rid of uh, uh, carcinogens. So it protects it against the ravages of UV uh, radiation. Uh, there's some derivatives uh, that we actually find, a product called DIM, uh, which literally we can take internally that protects us against gamma ray uh, exposure uh, as well from the sun. Green leafy vegetables, uh, and there was a wonderful study done on spinach, kale, and Swiss chard. And what they found that it had a potential of reducing squamous cell, cell skin cancer. You know, just a, a couple of servings a day or a one large serving by 50%. I mean, that's a pretty substantial, you know, a nice little leafy green salad every day, a pretty substantial decrease 
in uh, the exposure. Omega-3 fatty acids, and now they reduce uh, skin inflammation, um, but they also, bottom line, uh, produce certain types of chemicals that moisturize the skin from the inside out and give you some UVA, UVB protection. Um, histidine rich foods. Now, there's a certain type of acid called uricanic acid, and it's a natural photoprotectant. And histidine is found in meat, dairy products, grains such as rice, wheat, and rye. And this amino acid really helps produce this other type of acid, which literally is photoprotectant on the skin. Now, major cause of burning is when the skin is not hydrated. So, um, you know, you ha these leafy greens and all these vegetables I talked about are really potassium rich. The vitamin C helps the skin hold on to the collagen, which in turn helps you hold water. Now, water, keep, keeping the skin hydrated encourages the healthy uh, natural moisturization factor in combination with these other things I've mentioned, which in turn helps protect your skin some, from some of the environmental assaults that it incurs. So it's particularly important after you get um, sun exposure or if you can before to make sure you're hydrating really well with water and some source of electrolyte mixture as well too. Now I get a lot of people that come in and say, you know, I, I look at this, these sunscreens, and it looks like a chemical laboratory. And so I research the oils that have natural sun protection abilities to them. Number one, 40 SPF, little pricey of an oil, is carrot seed oil. Especially for the nose and the face, man, I think I'd be putting that on, or areas that you have a lot of sun exposure to more readily. Raspberry oil, not as common of an oil, has a 30 SPF. Very common oil, avocado oil, a 15 SPF. Now, what SPF means is you can be out in the sun, you can multiply that factor by 15 on the amount of time that you can be out in the sun. So if you tolerated 30 minutes out in the sun, put a little avocado out on there, it could give you some protection for three to seven additional hours out in the sun. Pretty phenomenal protection. Coconut oil, SPF of eight. Olive oil, something simple, extra virgin olive oil, SPF of eight. Macadamia oil, which we use a lot in, in fancy types of cooking, SPF of six. Almond oil, SPF of five, and hoba oil, SPF of four. When you look at these oils for everyday types of exposure, you know, we're just walking in and out, uh, in, in, out of the sun, Man, just minor amounts of SPF protection with using these to moisturize the skin should afford you in combination with these antioxidant protecting foods and supplements, the ability to prevent an awful lot of skin cancer. Anyway, I hope that uh, helps and answers a lot of questions, particularly of my customers <laughs> that were coming in the store saying, what can I do? I don't like the chemistry lab. Next, we're gonna be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're doing fine, honey. Don't worry. Hi, welcome to the research portion of our show. And with us today is Ralph Turciano. Ralph? And thank you for that intro. Now, mm -hmm. to start things off, let's look at organic farming once again at an incredible, what they call a groundbreaking research out of the British uh, Journal of Nutrition, they looked at 343 pure viewed studies on organic compared to conventional. Now, 
what they did is they said basically in the prior studies there were flaws in the soil that was used for organic and conventional saying they often used very similar soils in growing ironically the organic and the conventional to determine the nutrient content. They also said too that science has developed better techniques for determining antioxidants like polyphenols and basically phytochemicals and other compounds outside your standard A, C, E and other antioxidants like that. This is what they discovered. I'm only going to be brief. I'm not going to go into too much detail. And by the way, out of this groundbreaking research, they were only able to gather one American researcher to put his name on the papers itself, and that happened to be a Mr. Charles Benbrook of Washington State University. So what they discovered was this. Overall, organic fruits, vegetables, and cereals were 18 to 69% higher in antioxidant compounds. They also said that that would be the equivalent of getting 20 to 40% more antioxidants per day if you're eating just four servings of fruits and vegetables because basically that much antioxidant concentration from the organic is the equivalent of eating two extra portions of fruits and vegetables per day. In addition, for the bonus gift, the pesticide residues in organically managed fields, not organic foods supposedly grown with synthetic nitrogen fertilizers, which you can read the study and figure out how that worked out, was 10 to 100 fold, I'm saying 10 to 100 fold lower in pesticide residues than conventional. Also two, you get half the cadmium because something about the synthetic nitrogens that they're using as fertilizers does something to enhance cadmium absorption into the roots of the plant. So what you can take away is they said this, the study is a telling a powerful story, this is their quote, of how organic plant-based foods are nutritionally superior and deliver bona fide health benefits, minus the pesticides and chemicals that you don't want to be consuming anyways. Again, British Journal of Nutrition reviewed 343 peer-reviewed studies and came up with the results that organic is far superior to basically conventional. Something which I'm surprised the TV and media, or I should say local news stations, did not pick up on. After that, we find a new danger to antibiotics. And there's no doubt that antibiotics saved untold number of lives. But there's a danger to its overuse. And this titled research titled, Scientists Find Links Between Antibiotics, Bacterial Biofilms, and Chronic Infections. Now, there's an interesting thing about this. They found out that antibiotic use, if the antibiotic itself does not kill the basically bacteria right off the bat, it can lead to what's called chronic lung, sinus, and ear infections on its own, making a very simple problem a very bad problem. And it does this by helping create what's called biofilms. Ironically, what a biofilm is, is like a slimy, what they call polysaccharide. It's how the bacteria can find a new way of protecting itself that's beyond just being antibiotic resistant. Biofilms themselves, to give you an idea how antibiotic resistant they are on their own, is at least 1,000 times more antibiotic resistant than basically your standard bacteria on its own. So once this thing forms a biofilm, a slimy polysaccharide coating inside the lungs, sinuses, or ears, they now become embedded, fortified. Now here's the irony. The antibiotic, basically when the antibiotic is there, in the presence of this biofilm forming, the antibiotic itself actually converts meshes with the bacteria to form what's called glycogen or complex sugar molecules that actually feed the biofilm of bacteria on its own once the antibiotic is removed. So the irony is that bacteria have now learned how to use the antibiotic as a food source, actually what they call a never ending food source once the antibiotic administration is over. Mm -hmm. They say with the introduction of antibiotic produced glycogen, the biofilms have an almost endless food source that can be used once the antibiotic exposure has ended. And this is in their words. There are currently no approved treatments for biofilm related infections. Therefore, bacteria forced into forming stronger biofilms 
will become more difficult to treat and will cause more severe chronic infections. Adults will suffer protracted lung infections as the bacteria hunker down in the protective slime and children will have repeated ear infections. Mm -hmm. What may appear to be antibiotic resistance when an ear infection does not clear up may actually be biofilms at work. And there is no adequate treatment for biofilms once they form. Again, there are 1,000 times more resistance, resistant antibiotics on their own than basically just bad bacteria standing outside itself. Because oh. biofilms are protective shield that bacteria use to protect themselves and stay with you for a long time if antibiotics are not used properly. So again, if you don't have, if you have an option and something that's serious, and you don't have to take an antibiotic, it's something you really should consider because this stuff is scary. All right, now we move on. Let's take the avocado. In an interesting study, oh, by the way, the last study was in the Public Library of Science Online. Interesting article, though, in the Journal of Nutrition in regards to avocados. Avocados have an interesting effect of basically enhancing the conversion of basically beta carotene and carotenoids like that into actual vitamin A, especially when combined with an orange-containing food like a tomato or a carrot. Now, what they did, and this was the Journal of Nutrition, is they ran two studies, what they call a double-blind crossover placebo study, and they switched people around on top of that too, are basically what they call crossover and feeding studies. And what they discovered is this. When an avocado was combined with tomato sauce meal, preferably from like orange type tomatoes because of carotenoids, it more than doubled the beta carotene absorption, 2.4 times. More than quadrupled the conversion of pro-vitamin A into basically the inactive form to its active form, 4.6 times. When they went to go do the study again, and this time with raw carrots mixed in with avocado, what they found was even more astonishing. And they took one avocado, about 150 grams. Significantly increased beta carotene absorption 6.6 .6 times, again, when combined with carrots. More than quadrupled alpha carotene absorption 4.8 times. Significantly increased the conversion of pro-vitamin A it's an active form to its vitamin A active form 12.6 times. So there's something really to be said about food combining that it's just not basically to be done for flavor or taste or ambiance. When it is actually done properly, it actually makes it into a nutrient supercarrier. So something to think about avocado with either orange type tomatoes or carrots, wonderful pro vitamin A source, or I should say source that could turn the carotenoids into actual vitamin A. And if you're from British heritage, and a lot of the Brits have a problem converting the carotenes or carotenoids to pro-vitamin A, it's something to think about. Now we go to the American Diabetics Association. We have an issue here with the British Medical Journal and the World Health Organization and NICE, which, they, which is the National Institute for Healthcare and Excellence in the UK. And actually quite a few researchers from the UCL and the Mayo Clinic. And what is this and about in the American Diabetics Association? They have a strong disagreement what prediabetes is. In their words, labeling people with moderately high blood sugar as prediabetic is a drastically premature measure with no medical value and a huge financial and social cost, say the researchers from UCL and the Mayo Clinic. In fact, it even gets more damning than that. What they said is they're rating what they look for basically is the A1C levels. And they're saying basically between that you can be considered pre-diabetic between a 5.7 and a 6.4, input on anti-diabetic medications like metformin and things along those lines. These guys say it's a total waste of time and it basically implying it's almost, on their words, pretty equivalent to either scientifically totally unfounded or fraud. And this is why they say it. All right, they said, quote, pre-diabetes, this is their words, not mine, is an artificial category with virtually zero clinical relevance. There is no proven benefit of giving diabetes drugs to people in this category before they develop diabetes, particularly since many of them would never go on to develop diabetes 
Anyways, basically, this is why the World Health Organization and NICE, which is the National Institute of you know, Health out of the UK, are really biting this tooth and nail. They're concerned that the American Diabetic Association has so much incredible power and pull, the propaganda campaign they're utilizing may actually force them to move over to actually treating pre-diabetes, even though there's no fa sound scientific uh, confirmation that makes a bit of difference in the world. So previous studies have tested the effectiveness of giving people medications, metformin, uh, which is used to lower blood sugar in people with diabetes. The drug reduced the risk of developing diabetes by 31% over 2.8 years. All right, so we give it that. Probably delaying the onset rather than completely halting its development. But people who go on to develop diabetes are often treated with metformin anyways, and there is no evidence of long-term benefits to starting this treatment early. They also said, quote, the ADA recommends treating pre-diabetes with metformin. So you see a little conflict there? I'm not just saying you're pre-diabetic. We're saying you're pre-diabetic. Here, take this medication. But to go back, the ADA recommends treating pre-diabetic diabetes with metformin, but the majority of people would receive absolutely no benefit, said, says Professor Jerkin, one of the study coordinators itself. So big conflict between the ADA and the British Medical Journal, UCL, and the Mayo Clinic, World Health Organization, and NICE, which is the UK Health Foundation, They're all saying that the ADA basically is making things up. That's it, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ralph. I appreciate all that information. Boy, avocado, the superfood, and natural sunscreen. So anyway, um, uh, TV show is on Comcast, and you can also view it on youtube.com forward slash VH film. Thank you once again for joining our show. We appreciate it.